The story begins with the protagonist pleading desperately in front of her mother, asking her to believe her and trust that she didn't commit the wrongdoing she was accused of. Her sister Rue steps in, asking their mother to forgive the protagonist and just let her go. Their mother, however, reacts furiously, refusing to forgive. She angrily points out that the protagonist had held on to Rue's wealth for years, and now Rue was asking for mercy. The mother kicks the protagonist, and then comments on how kind-hearted Rue is, to which Rue responds by calling out to her mother. Internally, the protagonist reflects on her pain and despair, thinking that perhaps dying wouldn't be such a bad idea. Life had become unbearable, and she realized too late the cruelty of the person she had trusted. Her adopted sister, whom she had treated with kindness, had taken everything from her, the property that her grandfathers had given her, the love of her fiancé, and even the affection of her parents. For the past three years, she had been imprisoned in a dark and oppressive place, living a miserable existence like a mere insect. The mother coldly remarks that the protagonist wouldn't live much longer, and instructs Rue to throw her out to feed the dogs when she dies. Rue tries again to call her sister, but their mother harshly corrects her, reminding her that she is her real daughter. The mother turns to the protagonist, mocking her, and leaves. As she leaves, Rue slaps the protagonist and laughs, taunting her by saying that their mother was now her mother, and she was the only daughter of the Shu family. The protagonist, Zhu, burns with anger but remains powerless to act against them. Shu thinks to herself, regretting how foolish she had been to end up in such a miserable state. She had given everything to such an evil person, trusting her wholeheartedly, and now she was paying the price for her stupidity. Ru, with a smug tone, reveals the truth to Shu, knowing that she is near death. She tells Shu that she is in fact the real daughter of the Shu family. When the paternity test was conducted, Ru had switched the blood samples, making it seem like she was the rightful daughter. However, Ru admits that she doubts their parents would care about the truth. Zhu, with her tarnished reputation, wasn't worthy of being the Shu family's daughter. Even if they had suspected something, they would naturally have declared Zhu to be the fake daughter. Zhu tries to raise herself up, shocked and angry, but before she can respond, Ru continues. She notices Zhu's hatred and reveals more of her cruel deeds. Ru admits that it was she who had poisoned Shui's drink at the bar and led the reporters to capture the entire event. Shui's mind races as she realizes that everything had been part of Ru's scheme. Ever since Ru had entered her home, she had destroyed every part of Shui's life. Zhu feels a deep sense of injustice, wondering how she could have failed to see Ru's true nature, a wolf in sheep's clothing. As if her confessions weren't enough, Ru delivers one final blow. She tells Zhu to go to hell without any regrets revealing that Chen, the man Zhu once loved, could barely stand being with her, a disfigured woman. According to Ru, Chen always complained that being around Zhu made him want to gag, and Ru declares with confidence that she's the only woman Chen has ever truly loved. Zhu reflects bitterly on how she once viewed Ling Chen as a kind and loving man, to the point that she was willing to give everything to him, including the Zhu family and Yun family property. She had worked tirelessly day and night to manage it all for his benefit. But at the most crucial moment, he had betrayed her, stabbing her in the back and taking everything for himself. After that, he left her, his fiancée, to rot in a dark basement while Shui Ru toyed with her. Suddenly, Ling Chen arrives, his voice filled with disdain, asking if Ru had not played enough yet. He mockingly remarks that the disgusting bug is still alive. Zhu is stunned as she realizes that the man she once loved, the man she had lost her heart to, now refers to her as nothing more than a bug. She feels like a fool for not seeing his true nature earlier. Ru, pretending to show some remorse, says she can't bring herself to kill Shu because, after all, she's still her sister. Ling Chen sneers at this, calling Ru too kind-hearted. He then mocks Shu further, questioning how someone so filthy, who had allegedly slept with so many people, could deserve to be Ru's sister. Without hesitation, Ling Chen takes a knife and attacks Zhu, showing how simple it is to harm her. He coldly suggests that they just throw her out to feed the dogs. In her final thoughts, Zhui resigns herself to her fate, sarcastically acknowledging how both her biological mother and her fiancé had praised Xu Ru for her kindness, all while planning to throw her out to the dogs. She feels utterly defeated as a human being. In her mind, she calls herself an idiot, vowing that if she ever gets another life, she will remember these two people, especially Ling Chen with his doll-like face. Shu is overwhelmed by pain, 
both physical and emotional. The agony feels unbearable, as if her insides are being twisted and crushed, each breath a torment. Yet, this physical suffering is nothing compared to the mental anguish she endures. Once the high-flying daughter of the Shu family, she has now been reduced to a mere prisoner in a dark basement, treated like a worthless creature. She reflects on how her two grandfathers had entrusted her with everything from both the Shu and Yun families, but in her foolishness, she had allowed herself to be blinded by love and familial bonds. The sister she had so fiercely protected had betrayed her, stabbing her in the back with the very knife given to her by Shui's gentle and handsome fiancé. Zhu painfully recalls how he had even lovingly told her sister to be careful not to scratch her hand. Her thoughts grow darker as she remembers how her own parents, the ones who should have stood by her, instead considered her a disgrace. They had silently agreed to her imprisonment, turning a blind eye to her suffering. Shu's heart fills with bitterness. For the deep humiliation she has suffered, even if she were to descend into hell, she would not go willingly. Shui's body is racked with intense pain, her every nerve screaming in agony. She wonders if this torment will continue even after death. Struggling to open her eyes, she feels as though every part of her is being smashed into pieces. Suddenly, a familiar scene flashes before her. It feels like a memory buried deep in her mind. She recognizes it as the car accident from when she was 15, but how can that be possible? Just then, Uncle Chen, the driver who had always been with her since childhood, rushes to her side, asking if she's okay. Though her body is weak, Shu manages to reply that she is fine, but internally she is flooded with disbelief. Uncle Chen, didn't he die in the car accident that Shui Ru had orchestrated? How is he here now? A sudden realization hits her. She has come back. Back to three months before Shu Ru entered the Shu family. The day today is the same day as the car accident. Has she really been given a second chance Shu is mind races? Recalling that the accident had been planned by her distant cousin, Leng Shuang, Back then, she had been too naive and believed that it was an accident, never realizing that Leng Shuang had harbored jealousy and malice toward her for years. Leng Shuang rushes over, pretending concern and asking if Xu is okay. Zhu, however, can sense the malice behind her cousin's actions. She realizes that Leng Shuang intends to push her already injured waist, which could result in permanent damage to her spine if she applies enough pressure. Xu also notices the shock in Leng Shuang's eyes, as if she can't believe Zhu has retaliated. Lung Shuang, in disbelief, thinks to herself how it was possible for Xu Ei to hit her. She always viewed Xu as fragile despite her rebellious exterior. Over the years, Lung Shuang had almost trained her cousin to be an obedient pet. Though Zhu was the daughter of the Xu family, she had always been treated like a mere poodle in her eyes. But now, this so-called pet had dared to hit her. Feigning hurt, Lung Shuang exclaims how Zhu could strike her, reminding her that they are cousins. Zhu, seeing through the facade, coldly thinks how insignificant Leng Shuang truly is. If it weren't for the wealth and influence of the Xu family, the Leng family would never have sought to claim familial ties. Xu then calmly responds, apologizing and claiming she thought something was rushing at her when she got out of the car, and that she must have hurt Leng Shuang by accident. Relieved, Leng Shuang internally reasons that it must have been a simple mistake. Surely Shui couldn't have changed so quickly, not after years of training her to be submissive. She dismisses the hit, saying it didn't hurt and that Xu hadn't meant it. Still, deep down, Ling Shuang is puzzled, wondering why Xu Ei hadn't come to comfort her like she usually would, behaving like a fool under her control. Meanwhile, Uncle Chen, watching the scene unfold, expresses his suspicion aloud. He mentions that the car accident seemed unusual, as he had tried his best to avoid the crash, but the Leng family's driver had deliberately collided with them. Internally, he reflects on how he had long been wary of Leng Shuang's unnatural and manipulative behavior. He had warned Master Xu before, though Xu herself, in her rebellious phase, ignored him and remained overly kind to Leng Shuang, sharing everything with her. He now sees how ungrateful Leng Shuang had turned out to be. Leng Shuang tries to justify the accident, claiming the steering wheel had malfunctioned. She says the Leng family isn't as wealthy as the Xu family, so they couldn't afford a new car which led to the misfortune. She quickly adds that she's relieved Xu is fine and pleads for forgiveness. Xu, masking her thoughts, simply responds that it was due to this issue. But internally, her thoughts are far from forgiving. She recalls the serious injuries she suffered, the nearly broken ribs, the severely damaged lumbar spine, 
and the still bleeding forehead wound, and realizes how foolish she had been in her past life to let Leng Shuang off so easily, even when her injuries were considered fine by her cousin. Xu then asks with a touch of cold irony, should we buy a car? Leng Shuang, who had initially been startled by the slap, dismisses it as an accident. She still believes Ziyu is nothing more than a dog she can control, someone who will act however she wishes. Grateful for the opportunity, she says, if so, thank you, sister. Inwardly, Leng Shuang is already planning her next move, thinking about the limited edition sports car she has been eyeing for a while, something her family could never afford. She sees this as the perfect chance to make Xu Ziyu buy it for her. Xu calmly mentioned that they needed to buy a new car but clarified that she wouldn't be the one paying for it, instead asking Leng Shuang to compensate her. Leng Shuang, shocked by the unexpected demand, questioned what Su had just said. Su explained that the car was a special gift from her grandfather on her 15th birthday, with fewer than 20 in existence worldwide. She added that the damage was severe enough that the cost of repairs would equate to buying a new car, and for the sake of their friendship, she wouldn't ask for compensation for her medical expenses. Ling Shuang, still in disbelief, expressed her outrage, wondering how Shui could dare to ask her to pay for it. Internally, Lung Shuang thought that Shui must have hit her head in the accident, considering her completely different behavior. Shui, maintaining her firm stance, asked if Lung Shuang was sure she was speaking to her properly. Shui reflected on how a small family like the Lengs could never stand up to the Shu family. She thought that if Lung Shuang's mother hadn't made deliberate efforts to please her own mother, they would never have had the luxury of living like wealthy girls. Shui realized how for years she had shared everything with Lang Shuang, and it had led Lang to forget who she should truly respect and look up to. Lang Shuang, trying to maintain her composure, hesitantly asked if Shua was joking. Shui responded in a calm tone, confirming that she was not. She went on to explain that since Leng Shuang's car had crashed into hers, even if she didn't personally mind, her grandfather certainly wouldn't let it slide easily. Xu suggested that it would be best to let her grandfather and Leng Shuang's father discuss the specific compensation. As Xu considered the situation, she recalled how, in her previous life, Leng Shuang had simply cried and shed a few tears, which had led her to foolishly beg her grandfather to forgive the Leng family. That moment of... Weakness had caused her grandfather to be so disappointed in her that he no longer cared for his stupid granddaughter. This, in turn, gave Xu Ru the chance to enter the family. Xu calmly asked Uncle Chen if the car her grandfather sent had arrived yet. Uncle Chen responded that it would be there in about five minutes. He couldn't help but think to himself that Miss Xu's behavior this time far exceeded his expectations. Relieved that she was no longer being deceived by Lung Shuang's words, Xu acknowledged Uncle Chen's response with approval. Meanwhile, Uncle Chen reflected further, noting that this was the young lady that Master Xu had educated from childhood. He believed that once her arrogant and rebellious nature subsided, people would finally see her as the pure and delicate jade she truly was. Leng Shuang, now in a panic, thought to herself that if the old master of the Shu family personally confronted them, her father would surely be furious. She quickly pleaded with Shu, admitting her mistake and begging her not to inform Mr. Shu about the incident, fearing serious repercussions. Internally, however, she vowed that once she figured out the reason behind Shu Shu's sudden change in behavior, she would make her pay for it. Leng Shuang fumed at the thought, unable to accept that Shu Shu who had once been completely obedient to her, was now slipping out of her control. In her mind, Zhu Xu would always remain her puppet, destined to hand over everything the Xu family possessed to her. Xue addressed Lang Shuang sharply, asking why she would blame her for deliberately instructing the driver to crash into her car in an attempt to kill her. She questioned whether Lang Shuang thought her parents would adopt her as a daughter after her death. Lang Shuang tried to deny it, but Xue interrupted, asking if she hadn't expected Xu to publicly expose her wrongdoings, instead of forgiving her as she had in the past. Shui then declared her return, signaling that she was no longer the same naive girl. Three months later, Xu Xu had transformed. Since the car accident, she had changed from the mischievous, rebellious girl of the past into the flawless heir to the Xu family. Once a source of trouble and frustration for her parents and grandfather, Xu had now become a model student admired and envied by everyone around her. At Norton Business School, known for its elite students, Zhu Wei secured the top spot in the monthly exam, silencing those who once envied her for being the daughter of the Shu family. 
Even her parents, who had previously shown little affection for her, began to change their opinion, impressed by her recent accomplishments. Addressing her parents, Shui greeted them politely, while internally reflecting on how her mother, Yun Ru, who had recently been praised by her social circle, was likely feeling proud of her daughter's achievements. In this prestigious school filled with geniuses and nobles, securing first place showcased her excellence. Much to her mother's satisfaction, her mother, Yun Ru, asked if Shu had stayed up late studying again, showing a newfound warmth and appreciation. Shu noticed that her mother, who had once basked in the glory of being a wealthy young lady of the Yun family after marrying into the Shu family, now seemed to take pride in her daughter's success. Shu humbly replied that it was her duty. Meanwhile, her father, who had once viewed their marriage with indifference, began to reflect on how he never truly valued the result of this union, until now. Shu reflected on how her mother now seemed to realize that she had treated her daughter too coldly in the past. Three months was enough time to change many things. Her once stern grandfather had softened, showing affection towards his granddaughter, and her indifferent parents had become more caring. In that same period she had gone from being a poor student to securing the top position at school. Additionally, she had made the Leng family compensate her with the new car, and Leng Shuang no longer dared to speak recklessly in front of her. However, Xu felt that this was still not enough. She hadn't forgotten what tomorrow would bring. Norton Business School was the top middle school in the country, known for its exclusivity, admitting only true geniuses or real nobles. Initially, Xu had belonged to the latter group, but within just three months, she had transformed herself into one of the former. Xu greeted everyone in the classroom with a simple morning, to which her classmates responded warmly. As she reflected on the past three months, she realized that she had won over those who once dismissed her, thanks to her academic performance and changed attitude. Perhaps getting first place in one exam could be considered an accident, but securing the top spot three times in a row proved that she had truly become the best in school. The morning reading class progressed smoothly, though Xu noticed that many of her classmates occasionally glanced at her. It seemed even they didn't understand how after a mere car accident, she had transformed into someone so delicate, pure, and perfect after recovering from her injuries. Xu couldn't help but think about how those who once wanted to bully her now blushed at the sight of her. However, their thoughts didn't concern her. When the teacher asked Xu her opinion on a question, she stood up and thought about how cold her heart had become. She could now suppress her emotions and do everything flawlessly, responding with a calm, yes, Xu knew deep down that the long-term oppression she had faced had twisted her mind. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to describe her as a pervert, shaped by the pain and suffering she had endured. The teacher complimented Xu, telling her she was truly perfect. Xu couldn't help but reflect on how people saw her. A perfect family background, perfect looks, and now even perfect grades. Those who had once been jealous of her had begun to reflect on their own lives instead. Later in the evening, Uncle Chen asked Xu if schoolwork was exhausting, but she simply replied that it was fine and that she needed to keep learning. Deep down, she thought to herself that compared to the endless darkness she had faced, working hard made her feel content. When Xu returned home, she greeted her mother, who asked how her day had been. Shui responded that she was good and inquired if her mother had had a long day as well, as she thought about her family. Xu reflected on the fact that while part of the Xue family's property had been nominally passed to her father, Xue Chen, it was actually managed by her mother, Yun Ru, a very manipulative woman. Yun Ru, driven by ambition, took pleasure in controlling the family's business. However, she remained unaware of how aggressive her actions could be. Shui's mother complained about how her manager was an utter fool, and then shifted the conversation, asking about Shui's upcoming monthly exam. Zhu calmly reassured her mother that there shouldn't be any problem with the exam. Her mother expressed her expectation that Shu would get first place again, as she had before. Inwardly, Shu reflected on her mother's superficial concern, noting that while her mother only cared about whether Zhu stayed up late studying, she still pushed her to do her best. Yun Ru had always been vain, and for her, Shue's achievements were a means to maintain that vanity. To receive any form of maternal love, Xu felt she needed to continually meet these high expectations. It was nothing more than a transaction in her mother's eyes. Her mother then affirmed her belief that Zhu was the best, emphasizing how proud she was. Before leaving the conversation, she mentioned that she had another charity project at the Mercy Orphanage the next day and would skip breakfast at home. Xu thought to herself, 
recognizing the name Mercy Orphanage and recalling that it held significance. She realized that her sister hadn't tried to approach her through the usual methods like donating blood, but was still finding other ways to enter the Shu family. Zui noted how persistent her sister and others were in their efforts, refusing to give up easily. While it was common for entrepreneurs to use charitable activities to enhance their corporate image, Xu was certain that the choice of the Mercy Orphanage as a location was not a mere coincidence. Addressing her mother, Xu suggested that she should rest early, acknowledging the hard work she had been putting in. Uncle Chen thanked Xu for her efforts, curious if anything good had happened that day. He noticed that although Zhu always seemed to be in a good mood, there was something different about her today, as she appeared even happier than usual. Sue acknowledged his observation, admitting that she was indeed expecting something, though she kept the details to herself. In her thoughts, she eagerly anticipated meeting her good sister. At the Shu mansion, Yoon reflected on how much her daughter had changed since the car accident. The once difficult and unendearing personality of Shu had somehow transformed into someone Yoon now felt a growing affection for. She was amazed at how sensible her daughter had become. Meanwhile, Shui contemplated the situation, recalling that Shui Ru was raised by the dean of the orphanage and was known as the most obedient girl there, looking as cute as a doll. She didn't expect her mother to visit the orphanage again so soon, which stirred more thoughts in her mind. At the Mercy Orphanage, a man greeted Madame Yoon with great reverence, praising her presence as a blessing to the humble institution. Shui observed the scene thoughtfully, noting how the children knew deep down that no one stepping out of those luxurious cars had any intention of adopting them. The visitors, dressed elegantly and exuding wealth, did not display genuine compassion for the kids. To them, this was just another task to check off their list. The only fleeting changes the wealthy guests brought were the rare, flattering smiles from the dean and the extra meals and showers the children received in preparation for the visit. The envy and emptiness in the children's eyes made the smile on Yunru's face seem even colder. Yet something shifted when her gaze fell upon one particular girl. This little girl, standing apart, had an expression of deep longing and affection. Her careful smile and eager eyes radiated a desire to be loved, softening the heart of anyone capable of maternal warmth, even someone like Yunru, who normally wore an indifferent exterior. In the classroom, Zue reflected on her past life. She recalled how her mother, frustrated by her rebellious behavior, had come up with the idea of adopting a well-behaved orphan as a role model for her. What they hadn't anticipated was that this role model would bring chaos into their lives like a poisonous snake. Now that she had become obedient, she wondered if history was about to repeat itself. After school, when Shu returned home, Wang greeted her, welcoming her back. Shu thanked him, looking around and noticing the absence of anyone in the house. Wang informed her that Madame had not returned yet, to which Zhui acknowledged and mentioned she would go upstairs. As Zhui left, one of the maids commented on how amazing Miss Zhu seemed, noting how every time she saw her she appeared to be sparkling. The other maid agreed, expressing that she had also thought it was an illusion, describing her as being like an angel. Wang thought to himself that Zhu truly embodied the essence of the Zhu family, a flawless and perfect girl. He wondered why he hadn't noticed her beauty before reflecting that it might have been because Miss Xu had been living with her grandfather a few months ago and wasn't very close to her parents during her occasional visits. Home. However, after the car accident, she had convinced her grandfather and started living with her parents. It was only then that they all began to realize how gentle and beautiful she had become. Yuan arrived bringing along a young girl from the orphanage. Wang welcomed her and curiously asked about the child. Yun explained that the girl's name was Ru and she had grown up in the orphanage. Feeling pity for her, Yun decided to bring her back home. Wang couldn't help but think that it was unusual for Yun Ru to show kindness to anyone, especially to the extent of bringing this little girl home with the impulse to adopt her. However, the feeling didn't seem to last long. As the little girl timidly dodged behind Yun and held her fingertips, Yun felt a brief spark of maternal love once again, though she already seemed to regret her decision. Yun called out to Shu, but Ru, lost in her thoughts, couldn't help but admire how dazzlingly beautiful the real Miss Shu appeared. She reassured herself that it didn't matter, thinking that with time, everything would be hers, this grand house, and the title of Miss Shu. Ru reflected on how she had been trained since childhood to be a useful tool, and vowed not to let this naive young lady stand in her way. Meanwhile, 
She remembered how in her previous life, just one look at Rue's innocent expression had softened her heart. She had been like the Virgin Mary, caring little about her mother's careless decision to bring Rue home. Instead, Zhu had treated her as a sister, unaware that Rue must have been mocking her internally back then. Rue addressed Zhu as sister, and Zhu asked her with a seemingly innocent tone why she was crying, wondering if something was bothering her. Rue, however, was taken aback. She had investigated the Shue family's daughter, expecting her to be a mindless fool unloved by her parents. She believed that by simply flattering or displaying her cleverness, Zhu would grow soft-hearted. Rue hadn't anticipated such a direct question. Yun thought to herself that nothing irritated her more than others being dissatisfied with her decisions. Initially, Rue's tears had left her indifferent, but now, Yun felt Rue was overdoing it with her crying. It was as if people might assume she had forcibly brought Rue here. Addressing Rue, Yun questioned why she was crying, suggesting that instead of tears, she should be laughing with happiness upon arriving at the Su household. She added that Rue's tears made it seem like she didn't appreciate their family. Rue, in response, insisted she liked the Shu family and that her tears were from happiness. Yun reflected again, noting that while Rue had seemed cute at the orphanage, now, in comparison to Shu, she no longer appeared as endearing. Yun couldn't help but feel frustrated, wondering why Rao was acting as if she had been mistreated. She then instructed the butler to take Rue away and help her freshen up. Rue thought to herself that Yun Rue was always quick to sense deception. Any careless words on her part would only arouse endless suspicion. She couldn't afford to let Yun Rue detest or reject her. This was merely a small setback, and she would find a way to balance the odds. Later that evening, Shui's father heard about Rue but didn't react strongly. He didn't have much influence in the household, especially given his wife's domineering nature. He simply thought the girl looked like a cute and well-behaved doll and didn't comment much. After hearing her sweetly call him uncle several times, he began to develop a certain fondness for her. Meanwhile, Shu ate her meal quietly, appearing not to notice that the orphan girl was going out of her way to display her cleverness and act endearingly. Shui observed that Rue was acting aggressively, seemingly trying to overshadow the hosts and draw all attention to herself. Shu thought how uncouth Rue's behavior was, recalling the old saying, When eating, do not converse, and when in bed, do not speak. Meanwhile, Shui's parents wore amused smiles. They felt a subtle joy in Rue's presence, as Shui had been raised by her grandfather, leaving them little opportunity to experience traditional family happiness. Since Shui had returned after her car accident three months ago and moved in with them, she had been overly obedient and well-behaved. As a result, her parents seldom felt the warmth and affection that came from being doted on by their own daughter. Rue thought to herself how she would slowly steal away the love that Shui's parents had for their daughter, and eventually become the legitimate heir of the Shu family. Zhu politely excused herself from the table, telling her parents she was full and wished Ru an enjoyable meal. Her father responded by promising to have her favorite carrot juice sent upstairs, suggesting she rest. Meanwhile, her mother mentioned that she had picked out some new clothes for her and would have them shown to her soon, expecting Zhu to wear them when visiting her grandfather that weekend. Observing this, Ru realized that Shui's parents were genuinely competing to care for their daughter, showering her with sincere affection. By comparison, Ru felt like a mere clown, unable to compete with Shu no matter how clever she tried to be. Nonetheless, she reassured herself that this was just the beginning, and she still had plenty of time to change things in her favor. That night, Zhu reflected on her rebirth, realizing she now understood the true sources of power. Knowledge, though often overlooked, held great value. She acknowledged that if she hadn't been so complacent and consistently performed poorly in her studies in her previous life, she wouldn't have been overshadowed by Shui Ru, who had quickly impressed everyone when she first arrived at school. Deciding to clear her head, Shu stepped outside for some fresh air. Meanwhile, Ru was puzzled by Shui's reaction. She wondered why Zhu hadn't screamed in shock. Under normal circumstances, Ro thought, a girl would have been startled or might have even fallen down the stairs. But Shu remained calm, unsettling Ru. Ru had originally planned to make Shu scream, hoping that her parents would develop a sense of antipathy toward her. However, to her surprise, she ended up being the one startled. Shu then asked her calmly what was wrong and why she was standing outside the door. Ru quickly replied that it was nothing, but inside she was filled with panic. She realized that if she screamed in the middle of the night for no apparent reason, all the goodwill she had worked so hard to gain would vanish instantly. 
and she could potentially be kicked out of the house. Rue reminded herself that leaving the orphanage had been difficult enough, and she couldn't afford to go back. The thought of Zhu Zhu frustrated her even more, as she cursed her for being such a nuisance. Rue couldn't understand how Shu remained so calm after witnessing something that would have terrified most people. Shu reflected on her past, thinking that after spending an entire year locked in a basement with rats in complete darkness, there was no way she would react like a normal person to anything unsettling. She found the idea of becoming frightened, or even turning into a ghost, laughable and pathetic, when compared to the misery she had endured. Rue, trying to shift the conversation and avoid any blame, asked Shu if she hated her. Shu saw through her intentions, recognizing that Rue was trying to divert the topic, but calmly responded by reassuring her that there was no reason to hate her. Rue, continuing to feign humility, mentioned that she had grown up in an orphanage and would never have had the chance to stand beside Shu if not for Auntie's kindness. Shu, maintaining her composure, assured Rue not to worry, as she had grown up mostly alone and was genuinely happy to have a younger sister. She even added that having Rue around would probably make her mother happy too. Rue impulsively smacked Shu, pushing her away. Just then, Yun arrived and demanded to know what was going on. She raised her hand in surprise and thought to herself that she had initially believed Rue to be a sweet and clever child, but now realized how rude she truly was. Yun felt frustrated, thinking what an ungrateful girl Rue had turned out to be. Meanwhile, Rue tried to justify her actions in her mind, wondering why she felt so uncomfortable around Zhu. Even though Zhu hadn't done anything wrong, Rue's body reacted as if something was amiss. Quickly shifting her tone, Rue apologized to Shu, pleading for forgiveness. She explained that in the orphanage, she was often bullied by other children, and what she did was just a conditioned reflex. She begged them not to send her away. In her thoughts, Rue reflected on how uncomfortable she felt when Shu touched her. It was as if thousands of ants were crawling on her skin, making her feel sick, which is why she had instinctively patted Shu's hand away. Shu found Rao's pitiful appearance to be quite touching, and wanting to reassure her, told her not to cry, and expressed that there was no way she would send her away. Ru, uncertain, asked if that was truly the case, to which Shu confidently affirmed it, adding that they must get along well. Meanwhile, Ru's thoughts were filled with disdain. She believed that an orphan like her should feel grateful when treated kindly by someone wealthy. But instead, she loathed the hypocrisy in Shue's behavior. Ru questioned whether Shu saw herself as superior and silently vowed that Shu shouldn't be so confident. She was determined to take everything from Xu and make her even more pathetic than Ru currently was. Imagining how Zhu would react when that day came, Yun reflected on the situation, feeling that Zhu was being remarkably magnanimous. While the girl she had brought back from the orphanage seemed unreasonable, the fact that Ru was standing in front of her daughter's door in the middle of the night combined with her earlier actions, had already shattered the good impression Yun had initially formed. However, she realized that sending the girl back to the orphanage immediately would lead to unwanted gossip. Yun then instructed them to go to sleep, emphasizing that Shu needed proper rest due to her upcoming exam. Shu obediently agreed, and, as she prepared to leave, thought about how everything was different from her previous life. She pondered on what her dear sister would do next, anticipating Ru's future moves. At the Shui family's old house, Shu asked her grandfather how he was feeling, to which he responded that he was fine and invited her to sit down and talk with him, noting that she must be tired too. Uncle Chen observed the change in their relationship, recalling how not long ago they were often at odds. Shu had been stubborn and her grandfather had been firm in his demands, yet now the affection between them seemed much stronger than before. Su, however, insisted that she wasn't tired, reflecting inwardly, she realized that only by being reborn could she truly appreciate the wonderful things she had missed in her previous life. She understood now that, among her family, it was her grandfather who truly cared for her. She remembered how, in her previous life, he had held her tightly with his frail hand on his deathbed. But her foolishness had led her to ignore his words. In doing so, she had handed over the family's wealth to someone wicked. Grandpa asked Shu what she thought about the situation. Shu reflected on how her grandfather remained as direct as ever, never speaking in a roundabout way with her, unlike how he interacted in business circles. This straightforwardness was probably why they hadn't gotten along in her previous life. She had been too sensitive, 
but over the years she had come to realize that this was his unique way of showing care for those he valued. She responded by mentioning that now, with her mother having brought the girl back, she didn't really have a choice in the matter. Her grandfather revealed that he had looked into the girl's background and confirmed that she had indeed grown up in an orphanage, though he couldn't shake the feeling that something about her was off. Zhu asked for his opinion, to which he playfully reminded her that she already knew what he thought, calling her a naughty girl. Xu thought to herself about the many ways her grandfather could make someone disappear. She knew her grandfather was not a benevolent person, and if any hidden danger threatened his family, he would be willing to use unconventional methods to deal with it. As the head of the Xu family, he had many enemies waiting for an opportunity to strike, and without his constant vigilance, he would have been overwhelmed by them long ago. Xu acknowledged that there were flaws in the situation but continued reflecting. Even if others might view certain actions as accidents, her parents, who were fully aware of how her grandfather handled things, would be left feeling uncomfortable. In her mind, it wasn't worth taking such extreme measures for a girl like Rue. Grandpa, however, reassured Zhu that while she had grown up under his care, he had always taught her to act in an open and honorable way. He suspected that if the girl had truly grown up in an orphanage, she might have a cunning side to her that they should be cautious of. Grandpa reflected on how Zhu Xu was once a very good girl, though she would often deliberately oppose him during disagreements, and her academic performance had been below average. However, the disaster she faced had pushed her to strive for excellence. He wondered how this carefully nurtured jade would fare when faced with the rough leftover stones in her path. Xu confidently assured her grandfather not to underestimate her, as she believed she could protect herself. Grandpa thought about the days and nights Xu had endured, being bitten by bugs, rats, and ants, which had given her extraordinary willpower and endurance. In his mind, if she were to fail now, she would deserve such a fate. Amused, he called her a silly girl, but deep down he believed it might not be a bad idea to let her face some challenges. He recalled his own survival through bloody ordeals, thinking that without those near-death experiences, the Xu family wouldn't be what it was today. He concluded that a little hardship would be good for Xu, especially since he would be there to watch over her. Grandpa then shifted the conversation, asking her thoughts about the upcoming party in two days. Zhu was taken aback when her grandfather mentioned the party, feeling an overwhelming sense of uncertainty about attending. She recalled her previous experience at a banquet after the traumatic incident, where she had felt completely out of place and was ridiculed by other wealthy girls who had previously envied her. The only person who had reached out to help her then was a young man named Ling Chen. However, when she had clutched his hand in desperation, it had only drawn her deeper into a pit of despair. Xu remembered her younger sister, who appeared sweet and innocent, suddenly showing her affection during that time. At that moment, Xu had felt an inexplicable warmth. Now she recognized that her sister's intentions were ulterior. Her real target had been Ling Chen. The situation had been critical for the Ling family who were eager to expand their business, making it imperative for Ling Chen to marry into the Xu family. At that time, he found it hard to accept Zhu, whose reputation had been tarnished. Reflecting on these memories, Zhu felt a mix of emotions, uncertain about the path ahead. Xu asked her grandfather if she really had to go to the birthday banquet for the youngest son of the Ji family. Her grandfather explained that it was an important event. Xu thought about the Xu family's elevated status among the elites primarily due to their marriage connection with the Yuns, which allowed them to overshadow many other wealthy families. However, she recognized that the Ji family held a far greater power, capable of eliminating any opposition with ease. This mysterious family, largely indifferent to outside affairs, influenced significant economic events both domestically and internationally. Xu realized that while the Ji family might not harbor any ill feelings, Many others present would likely seize the opportunity to undermine the Xu family's reputation. Acknowledging the potential challenges ahead, Xu expressed her understanding of the situation. Xu reflected on the Ji family, recognizing them as a powerful family that had been out of her reach in her previous life. She considered the risks of provoking such a formidable force. That Sunday morning, her mother took her to an upscale beauty salon for a complete makeover. In her past life, Zhu had been rebellious and unwilling to attend parties, and her current feelings were no different. However, her mother, Yun Ru, appeared overly enthusiastic about the preparations, viewing Zhu not with maternal affection but rather as a valuable asset. Yun commented on Xue's increasing beauty, to which Zhu politely thanked her. 
Internally, Yun thought about how Zhui's beauty could pave the way for a marriage into a prestigious family like the Jais, elevating her own status in society. When Zhu inquired if something was wrong, Yun merely expressed her curiosity about whom Zhu might marry in the future, noting her daughter's maturity and beauty. Xu reflected on the idea of marriage, realizing that she had never given such problems much thought in this life. She remembered Shui Ru's words about kinship ties being little more than weak certificates of authenticity, making her wonder if any relationship in the world was truly dependable. In particular, she questioned the reliability of men's emotions, considering the notion of eternal love to be an unnecessary extravagance. As Qin Di greeted Yun Ru, Shui observed the interaction, noting that Qin Di was nothing more than an ordinary businesswoman who claimed kinship with the influential Shui family. If not for her humble service to Yun Ru, both she and her daughter Lang Xuan wouldn't have enjoyed their current comfortable lives. However, the recent car accident had caused a rift between the two families, and regardless of whether the accident was intentional or not, Yun Ru's attitude towards them had noticeably shifted. Yun Ru seemed less concerned with what had happened to Lang Shuang and more angered by the feeling of having raised an ungrateful person. Qin Di remarked how Xu looked prettier than before and wondered if it was for the Ji family banquet. Yun responded defensively, stating that she was simply a mother taking her daughter out for a beauty treatment. Qin Di, with a sly smile, mentioned that she too had brought her daughter, Lang Shuang, for a beauty treatment, noting that since Lang Shuang was about to join the Ji family, it was her duty as a mother to take good care of her. Lung Shuang, however, interjected, downplaying the situation. She mentioned that she had only dated the youngest son of the Ji family two or three times, and asked her mother not to speak so carelessly. Internally, Lung Shuang thought back to how, just the other day, she had to live cautiously under Xu Xu's watch. Even if she had wanted to plot against her, she would have done so with great care to avoid being discovered. Now, however, if she could align herself with the Ji family, who were wealthier and more powerful than the Shus, the tables would turn. She imagined the Sus would soon serve her like dogs, waiting to be tossed only the scraps she chose to give them. Yun, frustrated, dismissed their claims, telling Qin Di to stop with the nonsense. She scoffed at the idea that someone of their status could even think they had a chance with the Ji family. Qin Di, however, confidently reminded Yun that while they were only distant relatives of the Shus in the past, they would soon become relatives by marriage to the powerful Ji family. She assured Yun that she would remember her kindness and repay it when the time came. Enraged by the audacity, Yun declared that she had unknowingly been raising a heartless wolf all these years. Shindi coldly retorted that the shoes had treated them like dogs for so long, throwing them a bone when pleased and leftovers when they weren't. She questioned how noble Yun truly thought she was. Fuming, Yun responded that they would see how things turned out. Meanwhile, Leng Shuang addressed Xu Shui, thinking to herself that once she became the daughter-in-law of the Ji family, Xu Xu wouldn't matter at all. Before leaving, she mentioned that she would see Xu Xu at the banquet. Zhu, determined, expressed her intention to see Leng Shuang at the banquet, while internally recalling that something wonderful was destined to happen there, based on her memories from her previous life. In the car, Yun's thoughts raced as she reflected on the Ji family's immense power, capable of destroying everything she had with just a word. She was adamant that Chindi should not get the upper hand, feeling a fierce desire to prevent that from happening. Disappointed with Su, she lamented that despite her daughter's accomplishments, she wished Xu could be even better. Good enough for the youngest son of the Ji family to take the initiative to date her. Meanwhile, Shui thought to herself that her mother's greed was excessive. She had worked hard to meet Yun's expectations but she believed that if her mother continued to be so greedy, there would be consequences. Yun firmly instructed Zhu to attract the attention of the youngest son of the Ji family at the banquet, convinced that her daughter's beauty and perfection would draw praise from everyone, including him. She thought that for a young and impulsive teenager like him, as long as Zhu was willing to get close, there were no limits to what she could gain. Zhu hesitated acknowledging the significance of the Ji family's youngest son but questioning her mother's approach. Yun countered that fortune favored the bold and emphasized that marrying him would secure their financial future. Xu reminded her mother that they were already stable and didn't need to worry about making a living. Yun, dismissing Xu's perspective, insisted that their current situation was far from sufficient. She highlighted the power that would come with such a marriage, allowing Xu to manipulate anyone. 
even someone as lowly as Chin Di, whom she viewed with disdain, scoffing at the idea that Chin Di was assured of victory. Xu reflects that, in the final analysis, it is still a matter of greed. She believes that humans, after satisfying their basic needs, always seek higher things. Even those who are already elite still desire more wealth. She feels that her mother, irritated by a few words, now wants her daughter to go to every length and sacrifice her virginity. Zhu finds such a mother just as repulsive as before. Zhu acknowledges her mother with a simple response. Uncle Chen wonders why Sui's attitude is so offhand with him. He thinks that if Shu had not been brought up by her grandfather, whom he cannot afford to offend, he would teach her a lesson. Uncle Chen reflected on Mr. Shu's past dissatisfaction with his daughter-in-law, recalling how he had taken his granddaughter away to teach her personally. He perceived that Yun was only interested in profit, pressuring her daughter to use contemptible methods to marry a wealthy young man while neglecting her own happiness. He questioned whether such behavior was appropriate for a mother. Even if Shu managed to marry into the Ji family through these means, Uncle Chen believed she would never earn proper respect or find true happiness. He found it puzzling that Yun, blinded by greed, failed to see this, showing no concern for her daughter's well-being. He felt fortunate that Shu had been raised by her grandfather. Otherwise, her life would likely be ruined under such a mother's influence. Shu steps out of the car and expresses her gratitude to Uncle Chen for his hard work. Yun and Shui start heading towards the house. Meanwhile, Uncle Chen is on the phone, speaking to his master about the events of the day. Ru greets Yun, calling her mom, which surprises Yun. She wonders how the child she brought back from the orphanage could be so shameless. Ru apologizes, explaining that she called Yun mom because she finds her kind, like the mother in her dreams, and asks if she is not allowed to do so. She continues to apologize, admitting she acted on her own. Yun reflects that after that night, she no longer sees the girl as naive or adorable, and just wants an excuse to get rid of her soon. She contemplates that if Shui is unwilling to seduce the youngest son of the Ji family with her virginity, perhaps the girl from the orphanage could be an alternative. Yun then addresses Ru, telling her that from now on, her name will be Shu Ru. Ru reflects that the simple words Shu Ru are equivalent to Yun recognizing her as her daughter. She then eagerly asks if she is really Yun's daughter now, and if she can call her mom, Yun confirms this. Ru thinks to herself that in a blink of an eye, Shui's mother has become hers, and soon everything Zhu has will also become hers. Shu congratulates her sister. Ru continues to think that from now on, she will be worshipped by others, and will no longer have to endure the unpleasant kisses and random touches of the dean's husband for a bit of privilege. She considers that, if it weren't for the dean's close attention, her situation might have been even worse. Ru thinks to herself that it doesn't matter because once she is powerful and completes her mission, she will burn down the orphanage along with her filthy past. She then invites the maid to come in. The maid informs Ru that the dress Madame prepared for her is ready and that the stylist is waiting in the dressing room. Ru asks the maid to wait a minute and internally fumes questioning how a servant can treat her so casually now that she is the second daughter of the Shu family. She resolves to maintain a gentle facade in front of Mr. and Mrs. Shu and her so-called sister, but refuses to extend the same courtesy to others. The maid asks if there is anything else she can do for Ru. Ru thinks that, while Mr. and Mrs. Zhu might not see through her act, those from the lower classes can easily spot the wild ambition hidden in her heart. She believes her affected manners are no match for Miss Sue. Rue then demands an apology from the maid. The maid questions why she should apologize, to which Rue responds that a master does not need a reason to make her servants apologize. Rue thinks to herself how hateful it is that such a person would dare to give her attitude, deciding to punish the maid as a warning to others. The maid questions Rue's authority, recalling that Mrs. Shu brought her back from the orphanage just two days ago. Ru pulls a knife from under the blanket and tells the maid that it's too late to apologize now, accusing her of ruining the dress and demanding to know how she plans to compensate for it. The maid protests, insisting that Ru ruined the dress herself. Ru denies this, questioning why she would ruin her own dress, and suggesting that someone must be jealous of her new status as the second daughter of the Shu family, or that someone instigated the maid to ruin the dress to prevent her from attending the party. The maid vehemently denies any wrongdoing. Ru points out that no one will believe the maid and speculates that the dress is expensive, implying that the maid will lose her job. 
she suggests that if someone, like the oldest daughter of the Shu family, asked the maid to do it, she might be excused from compensation. The maid, however, stands firm, accusing Rue of trying to frame Miss Su. Rue tells the maid that there is no surveillance camera in her room, giving her the option to either pay for the dress herself or claim that Shu Shu told her to do it, suggesting that the latter would be easier. Rue then thinks that if the eldest daughter of the Su family is grounded today, and she is the only one who can attend the birthday banquet, she will be treated as the Su daughter and receive much flattery. Zhu arrives and questions what would happen if she had recorded Rue's words. Rue is taken aback, and Shu asks why she would do such a thing. The maid explains that Rue framed her and tore the dress herself, expressing concern about Rue's scheming nature and suggesting that she should not be kept in the house. Shu acknowledges hearing everything and thanks the maid for her hard work allowing her to leave while she talks with her sister. Ru pleads with Shu, promising not to repeat her actions. Su agrees not to tell their mother this time, but asks Ru to promise her one thing. Ru reluctantly agrees. At the Ji's manor, Ji Yi remarks that Yang has come in first again, and taunts Ji Ming, who had always claimed to be the best, for losing at riding. Ji Ming retorts, pointing out that Ji Yi is no different, and reminding him that since he lost this time, he must give up his hotel. The Ji family, standing at the top of the social pyramid, maintains their wealth and status across generations by carefully cultivating and selecting their offspring. The heir is not chosen based on age or virtue, but on survival and demonstrated talent. Ji Yong demands the stake and tells Ji Ming to take it. Ji Ming informs Yong that there will be a big party for his birthday this year, hinting at the reason behind it. He mentions that if Yong, who is still a virgin, takes a liking to any girl, he should let them know, as it is his beauty pageant dinner party tonight. Ji Yi warns Yong to be careful because the girl might not let go after he touches her. He reveals that Ji Ming picked up a girl named Leng Shuang under Yang's name two days ago, and now she calls every day to badger him. Ji Ming tells Ji Yi to get lost and keep quiet about it, insisting he would never be serious with a girl from a parvenu family and was just having some fun. Yang questions the use of his name, and Ji Ming explains that the girl started pestering him after learning he was from the Ji family. Thinking he was Yang, Ji Ming did not correct her. Ji Ming reflects that as the designated heir of the Ji family, Yang Se in the family is second only to the head of the family. Although they usually joke around, they never dare to cross the line. Yang demands a mall under Ji Ming's name, to which Ji Ming agrees. Yang then instructs Ji Ming to deal with the girl as soon as possible, and Ji Ming complies. Ji reflects on how the younger generation of the Ji family are like competitors. A maid informs the young masters that the banquet will begin shortly and that the master requests their presence in the study. Ji Ye thinks about the cruel rules of the Ji family and how the glory the winner enjoys far surpasses what the hypocrites around them gain. The notion of winner takes all is clearly reflected in their family dynamics. Yang tells everyone to proceed and they head to the car. In the car, Yun wonders why Zhue, who is usually very punctual, is coming later than usual for such an important banquet in the memorial hall. She questions if Zhue is becoming disobedient again. Ru and Shu step out of the car, followed by Yun, who immediately questions why Ru is wearing her sister's dress. Ru explains that her dress was accidentally torn, so her sister lent her this one. Shu adds that Ru looks very beautiful in the dress, so she gave it to her. Yun thinks to herself that the dress she got for Shu Shu a bright red evening gown, is now on Shuru. It's expensive and extremely seductive, meant to catch the eye of the youngest Ji son in the crowd. She feels that all her preparations have been in vain. Yun's husband tries to calm her, saying that Shu looks good in the dress too, and urging her not to be angry. Shu reflects on how, in her previous life, she discovered that her cowardly father always advocated for her younger sister, wondering if it was because she was smarter. Ru thinks about whether Zhu Shu is too kind or too stupid, noting that not only did Zhu forgive her, but she also asked her to wear this dress, which is much more exquisite than her original one. Ru believes that someone like Shu, who she sees as a doormat, deserves to lose everything, as survival of the fittest is the natural law. Leng Shuang, distressed, tells her mother that the man she thought was Ji Yong is actually Ji Ming, the third son of the Ji family, calling him a fraud. Qin Di reflects that although being the third son of the Ji family sounds prestigious, only Ji Yong can inherit the Ji fortune. Once Ji Yong turns 25 and takes control of the family, 
the other young masters will be driven out and cut off. She thinks that an important person who has fallen from grace is worse off than an ordinary person, and the third G son means nothing at all. She laments that she thought her daughter was lucky to find a good match, only to lose her virginity to a deceitful man. Leng Shuang furious calls Ji Ming a bastard for lying to her, expressing her desire to be with the youngest Ji son. Qin Di, exasperated, tells her to stop crying and calls her a disgrace. Yun reflects that she rejoiced too soon and even boasted before Yun Ru, but none of it was real. She then advises that what's done is done, and Leng Shuang should continue playing the third young master while thinking of other ways to approach Ji Yang. She adds that if it doesn't work, the Ji family has a rule that only the strongest can inherit the family fortune, implying that if Ji Yong dies he will naturally fail to be the strongest. Leng Shuang worries about what will happen if Ji Yong takes a liking to Xu Zhu. Qin Di responds that if they can't have him, then neither should anyone else. She thinks to herself that. She doesn't want to use such extreme measures, but she didn't expect such an unforeseen event. She reflects on how Yun Ru has trampled on her for many years and resolves not to put up with it any longer, wondering what Yun Ru's expression will be if she ruins her daughter.